Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Synergy Flavours Trendcast. My name is Natalie Drake and I am the category manager for bakery and dairy at Synergy Flavours. I am joined today by my colleague Chris Whiting, who is our category manager for savoury nutrition. Today we are going to be taking you through our consumer trend report, which highlights the key consumers that are going to be driving innovation in 2021 and how we can support you with tapping into these trends. Our trend report was created using a range of market data sources, including Mintel, Euromonitor and the Food People. We combined this also with our own desk research and knowledge of our markets. Alongside myself and Chris, additional contributors to this report are Vicky Berry, who is our business development manager for the beverage category, and Sarah Kelly, who is our commercial graduate. Within this report, we have highlighted five key consumer types that we believe will be driving innovation in 2021. We have also linked each consumer type with some key trends. For each of these key trends, we will explain the key drivers, what the trend means for the food and drink industry, as well as offering examples of product launches highlighting the trend. We have also highlighted how we can support you in your development process if you want to explore the trends in more detail. The first consumer type that we've picked out is the food philosopher. So the food philosopher really values their family time. It's their top priority in life, and this is really having an impact on their food choices as their children grow up. The children themselves even now are becoming quite influential consumers. So these consumers are likely to have more disposable income. They can afford to make more conscious choices. Um, they're much more aware about how their lifestyle and their food choices might affect them, their children and the future of the planet. The first trend that we've picked out um, that links in with the food philosopher is all about allergen free. So what does that mean? Consumers are becoming increasingly aware of allergens in food. Um, we're seeing a lot more manufacturers creating greater visibility on allergen labeling and consumers are actually choosing to adopt an allergen free diet, even if they don't necessarily have an um, allergy themselves. So this trend is really being driven by recent media coverage of severe allergic reactions. Um, there's a growing list of registered allergens in the EU. We now have 14 registered major allergens. Um, there's various changes in laws around allergen labelling, which is really putting it in the spotlight in the media. We're seeing increased awareness of special diets, so things like FODMAP diets for intolerances and parents with young children are seeking products with allergen friendly claims as well. So looking at some examples of some product launches where we've seen this trend, we, we've seen things like bakery mixes that's free from a lot of allergens, things like gluten, wheat, dairy, soy and yeast, um, and also suitable for vegans as well, which is an added bonus. Um, no added sulfites is a claim that's coming through quite a lot at the moment. Um, things like cold blades, plant-based cold brew um, that's free from the top eight major allergens as well. We've also seen um, this vegan ready meal which has um, it is free from the 14 um, registered allergens I mentioned previously. In terms of what we're seeing in other other areas so seed butter is a trend that we're seeing quite a bit at the moment so things like sunflower pumpkin seed butter as it's a perfect alternative for people who suffer from nut allergies. Uh, the latest dairy alternative to sweep Australia um, now is camel milk and we're likely to see that come into the UK as well. So in terms of our offering, so we have various masking and harmonizing flavors that really work well with um, some of these free from ingredients and help to round off the flavor profile of these products. Um, we also have a range of milk and dairy flavors that are really great for dairy free products and really helps add that creamy note um, to some of those products as well. For, so the food philosopher and uh, the next trend is flexitarian. So what does that mean? So a lot of consumers are now choosing to adopt plant-based diets on a part-time basis. 
Um, so they might be choosing to do that um, for their health or perhaps for um, environmental reasons, um, but they do still eat meat and fish and dairy products. Um, they just choose to reduce their consumption of those um, products. So this trend's really been driven by um, increasing concerns about the impact of farming on the planet, um, on animal welfare. Consumers might be looking for um, more vegetarian meals um, coming into their diet to introduce things like grains, vegetables and legumes. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of traditional meat and dairy brands really making waves in this space as well. So it's not just the traditional vegan brands that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of um, manufacturers who traditionally would manufacture products with meat or products with dairy and they're actually moving into this space as well. So it's really um, quite a saturated market. So some examples of some product launches that we've seen. So things like um, these hex sausages where super green um, vegetables have been added in. Um, things like vegan um, versions of favourite products. So a vegan Cornish pasty. Obviously we have the Greg's vegan sausage roll as well. Um, hybrid is a really interesting trend that we're starting to see coming through as well. So this is when um, meat or dairy products are blended with vegetarian products. So the idea is that it's for flexitarians who want to reduce their meat or dairy consumption, but they still want to get the flavour from meat. So an example of that is this blend of lean beef and beans um, from Lean and Bean. Um, and also Arla have launched a lacto-free milk that's combined with oat milk as well. And then finally, obviously we have all of the meat alternatives on the market as well. Um, so this brand, this isn't chicken, um, but they really made it taste like chicken as well. So um, something that's highlighted a lot um, within this trend. In terms of what we're seeing on the restaurant scene, so Wagamama, recently launched the, a dish with the world's first vegan egg um, that you can see on the left hand side there and um, Press are set to launch vegan versions of their top sandwiches as well so that includes things like a tuna mayo, um, a hoisin mushroom and the VLT. So in terms of our offering um, Synergy has done a lot of work in this space um, so we've worked on meat alternatives, um, so we know, really understand the complex flavours that are coming through um, in those sometimes difficult to work with bases. Um, so we have a range of meat flavours, so chicken, beef, various cured meats as well. Um, we've also looked at um, savoury enhancers, so umami and kukumi to really boost the, the savoury enhancers that might be lacking in vegetables, but you would expect to get from a meat product. Um, we also have vegan friendly dairy flavours, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, so things like milks, creams and yogurts that are great for dairy free products. And we have also done a lot of analytical research in flavour pairing and harmonising. So that's looking at a product that's really hard um, to master flavour with. So you might want to use a flavour that works with some of those off notes and just rounds out the whole profile. Um, of the product there. So the final trend under the food philosopher is clean label 2.0. So this is basically the next stage on of clean label. So clean label is a trend that's been around for a while now, but it's really being stepped up now um, by manufacturers. Um, so this is this basically is all about um, consumers wanting to know more about their products than ever before. We're seeing clean eating um, being tipped to be the next healthy trend as it becomes more of a lifestyle choice. And we're seeing a lot of ingredients lists becoming shorter and more recognisable as well. So this trend is really being driven by a lot of food scandals that we've seen in the media. Um, a lot of consumers are um, starting to lack trust from manufacturers. Um, and an example of a quote there, the backstory really helps to create an element of trust um, and that's something that the food philosopher especially is really taking on as their mantra. Consumers now have increased choice, so they have more disposable 
disposable incomes, so they can afford to be a bit more choosy with their product choices. Um, and also many consumers now associate a product that's natural um, with health connotations as well. So some examples of some product launches. Um, this is really themed around the um, description of the product that's on the packaging. So we're seeing things like only three ingredients, nothing added, cold press is another key phrase that we're seeing a lot, um, whole strawberries and fresh cream, really making it sound like it was made in someone's kitchen. Um, looking at some of the fastest growing flavours in product launches, we're seeing an increase in unflavoured or plain launches, which is interesting to see. Um, and then outside of that, we're seeing a lot more natural flavours coming through. So this kind of give, gives rise to things like extracts, um, FTNF flavours, um, and that ties in with our offering as well. Um, so we have a lot of clean label extracts um, in our range that cover citrus fruits, botanicals and florals, herbs and vanilla extract as well. Um, we also have a range of really clean label essences that if paired with um, the certain ingredient that's being used, they don't actually have to be declared out on pack. So a lot of different things within our range that can help tap into this clean label trend. OK, so our next consumer trend is the game changer. So the game changer is very much um, focused on innovation, uh, very forward thinking, very fast moving as well. And really to tap into this uh, consumer, you have to be staying ahead of the curve. The key trends within our game changer consumer are blurring lines, bright and bold and the craft movement. So the first element within that is bright and bold. And this is really about kind of attracting people's attention, really portraying a sense of fun with your brand and luring consumers in through that. So in terms of what's driving this trend, more consumers are looking for so looking towards social media for food ideas and inspiration. And this is where visuals are really key. You know, you need something that's going to jump out of people on shelves, but also look good if they, um, you know, if they want to, to put it on social media, it needs to be Instagrammable, so to speak. Um, consumers are also looking for a sense of fun with these type of products. Um, it's kind of a, a bit of a break from more healthier or more natural options that they potentially consume daily. So they want something that's a bit of an indulgent treat um, that's going to kind of break from that norm and bring a little fun back into their days. In terms of what it means, um, there's a continued emphasis on colours and visuals in products. So this is something we've seen really for the last um, you know, half a decade at least that um, visuals are so key to food and drink now. It's inevitably started to spill out into um, retailer launches. So that's going to be key to, to pulling consumers' eyes onto the area of the shelf that your product is occupying. Um, there's a need to kind of uh, launch novel flavours as well and potentially pair these with those specific colours. So um, if you are going to make something that is unicorn themed and a variety of different colours, you need to kind of think about how you can uh, bring your flavour in to pair with that. And we're seeing a lot of flavour colour pairings as well, but also a little bit of um, playing on that idea as well uh, and taking something that should be one colour but flavouring in another and playing on consumers' expectations in that sense. We're also seeing multi-layered and multi-coloured products that I talked about, you know, in the sports nutrition space, for example, there's a, a huge move towards multi-layered bars. Um, we're seeing multi-coloured products um, appearing across all categories as well. You know, even some very clever things happening in drinks with, um, you know, uh, gold leaf infusions or or different, um, you know, different, different colours that appear as you add another product, for example, with gin and tonic um, or, or potentially if you shake the bottle up or leave it to sit. So there's a lot of clever things um, being done in this space and also tying in with this bright and bold. It's also theming products around um, global events, um, be that seasonal or be that sporting or, or anything else. Um, there's a good opportunity in this space to kind of innovate around those products. And it's something that we are seeing really across all categories. You know, we're seeing co-branded confection launches in sports nutrition. Um, we're seeing some very interesting colours th come through into 
into beverage, different packaging formats, anything really to to catch the eye of the consumer. And really, this comes down to that um, that statistic there. You know, 49% of consumers learn about food through social networks. So there's a real importance of your product looking good online and being able to catch people's imagination. We're bombarded with so much stuff on social media now that really your product has to go to great lengths in order to stand out online. The next element of the game changer is looking at this idea of blurring the lines. So this incorporates a few different elements. On the one hand, it's about blurring categories, but it's also about blurring flavors and just general consumer expectations. So the drivers behind this trend are very similar to Bright and Bold. You know, consumers are looking for products which can kind of break the day to day monotony and impart a little bit of fun into their daily routines. Consumers are always on the lookout for new flavors, formats, product types, and they like to see favorite flavors transported into other novel product categories. So a good example there is a couple of, uh, couple of nostalgic flavors, um, you know, the Sunny D um, drink being brought into a confectionery style product or the Freddo, uh, the classic Freddo chocolate bar being brought into a party cake. You know, there's this desire there for consumers to see um, see nostalgic flavors so 60 percent of consumers saying they'd be interested in buying discontinued brands for their childhood so it's natural that that's going to kind of um uh, steer through into other product categories and if there's uh, a co-branding exercise being done that's something that's going to be appeal to consumers um, who enjoy that classic brand but are keen to see it in new formats so in terms of what this means uh, we're seeing a lot more alcohol flavors being used across multiple categories so um, taking the idea of you know cocktail inspired and bringing it into uh, confectionery or yogurts um, you know there's there's a load of different uh, ideas around that we're also seeing an increase in in sweet and savory and kind of sweet and spicy as well um, going beyond the classic chocolate chili and bringing in different um, different spicy profiles or smokes as well another key element within this you know we're seeing a lot of smoked sweet products out there as well um, we're seeing classic and nostalgic flavors being transferred into new categories that I talked about and also fancy flavors as well have a big role to play in blurring the lines. This idea of, uh, of taking something very creative that, um, you know, doesn't doesn't naturally exist, such as a unicorn and um, bringing it into a into a creative product. And really, there's, you know, a few different elements to this things like the the savory yogurts there is really taking a, a classic product category and turning it on its head the final um, element then to the game changer is this idea of the craft movement and this has kind of been going for the best part of a decade now really but continues to be a real driver um, behind pretty much all categories and crucially being the driver of innovation typically the craft um, the craft producers uh, within this within these market spaces they're the ones that are pushing the boundaries and driving categories forward so in terms of what's driving this trend you know consumers are to an extent starting to tire of some of the the larger brands that have dominated the landscape for a long time they're not going to abandon these classic brands completely but it does mean that maybe they are going to look to different um, brands as and when they appear. Particularly millennials are a very big driver of this um, category. They're kind of um, choosing to spend their money on rarer, more premium treats. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, maybe rather than having uh, four or eight cans of um, kind of a, a, a a standard lager they might go for one or two kind of craft ipas or something pay a bit more um but potentially uh, enjoy the experience a little bit more and we're seeing more craft listings in retailers driving this innovation so in terms of what it means um there's kind of a few facets to this so uh, on the one hand, you know, craft brands are chipping away at the multinationals market share, and this is happening across all categories pretty much. And it's been happening for a good few years now to the point where the multinationals are kind of starting to to wake up a little bit and do something about it. So on the one hand, we're seeing um, big brands actually buying smaller craft brands and incorporating that into their overall brand architecture. We're also seeing uh, other brands take a different approach and launch their own craft products. So um, try to move into that space away from their core brand. And there have been a few brands that have 
done a great job um, of this. Um, you know, take someone like Guinness's Hop House 13 ha has done a, a great job of kind of managing to, to move into that space a little bit. Um, we're also as well seeing, um, I guess, the larger brands try to, to innovate a little bit more like craft brands. So Coca-Cola being a, a great example there, you know, although they've kind of always had flavoured variants, the level of activity in the last couple of years has really um, ramped up in, in the UK and Europe. So, for example, the uh, the mixers range that they launched last year, quite a, a significant diversion from the core Coca-Cola brand, but also the number of different flavors they've been launching as well on the main on the main brand. So um, in the last couple of years, you know, there's been strawberry, raspberry, um, peach variants uh, and a few others as well. So there's a real effort being made by the big brands to, to try and move into this space. And in terms of product launches, when you start to look at these, you see some pretty um, obvious trends start to emerge. There's a lot of very premium uh, call outs that start to appear. So things like small batch, uh, artisanal, handmade, craft brewed, these sort of call outs to try and lure consumers in a little bit more. And I think the very exciting um, element to this, at least from our point of view, is that there is a real opportunity to push boundaries in terms of flavour with the craft movement. You know, 57% of craft alcohol buyers consider a unique flavour to be the most important purchasing factor. This is compared to 30% for non-craft buyers. So there's a real opportunity to appeal to the craft consumer through flavour innovation, potentially at the expense of something like health. If someone is buying a real premium craft product, it's likely to be a treat um, and not such a regular occurrence. Therefore, they're willing to sacrifice maybe the nutritionals to ensure that it's going to be a great tasting and interesting product. OK, so our next consumer trend is a bit of a strange one. Obviously, the world was a very different place than it is today when we initially pulled this report together. Um, but I still think it remains a very relevant consumer trend and consumer profile. Our ability to travel globally, to visit uh, street food uh, festivals, to go to different restaurants, obviously that is um, significantly limited at the moment. But I think the idea behind this and the idea of um, you know, the shrinking globe through digital means is still very, very relevant. You know, and I can still um, go on Google, search for an authentic Korean bulgogi recipe, and I can find something that was written by someone halfway across the world. Um, and so there's still going to be that element driving people's interest in different cuisines. Again, they come with some caveats, but we picked out two cuisine trends within this, that being uh, Japanese and Italian. But again, they still remain um, very relevant, even in the current uh, circumstances. So in terms of the Japanese trend, this was um, driven by this idea of there being kind of spotlight on Japanese due to a number of different sporting events. So we had the Rugby World Cup at the end of 2019. We we're obviously uh, expected to have the Olympics um, in summer 2020. This has now been pushed out to uh, summer 2021, which actually potentially just extends this trend um, further and keeps it top of people's minds for a little bit longer. But even Olympic and uh, sporting events aside, you know, there's still a big focus and a big interest on Japanese cuisine at the moment. Um, the number of tourists in Japan has been increasing significantly over the last decade. Um, in 2018, there were 31.2 million visitors. Again, obviously, global travel is now significantly inhibited, but there are still there's still a lot of people who have been to Japan, who have come back, who have brought ideas, who have talked about the cuisine with their friends, their colleagues. So there's a lot of interest still in Japanese cuisine. And I think crucially, you know, 26% of consumers have eaten Japanese in the last month, but a further 43 will be interested. So there's still a huge, uh, a hugely significant uh, amount of potential market penetration there. You know, there's still another more or less double um, amount of interest on what's currently being eaten at the moment. So there's a huge uh, option for growth uh, in Japanese cuisine. And I think Japanese cuisine as well, you know, it's seen as being very visual for our 
Instagram age, it's seen as very uh, innovative. You look at KitKat, for example, there are a pretty limited number of um, product launches and innovations in the UK and Europe. But in Japan, it's viewed as this incredibly exciting brand that's constantly innovating, you know, playing with different tastes, playing with the senses. You know, you've got everything from matcha green tea to wasabi um, to cherry blossom. You know, there's a load of flavors. So it's seen as a very innovative country from a taste and uh, flavor perspective. So I think there's a lot of excitement um, around this. Our next. Um, cuisine trend within the globe trotter consumer trend is Italian um, and I think Italian's another nice one because it's a very unifying um, cuisine you know it it spans different age groups it spans different demographics you know there's kind of something for everyone from the fussiest of eaters to the most adventurous um, so I think it, it really offers a nice way of kind of bridging that gap and offering something for everyone we're also seeing a lot of chefs um, promote and push Italian heavily. Um, Jamie Oliver being a great example of um, of, of a, a chef doing that. You know, he essentially runs the most viewed food website in the world, 10 million visitors per month. And for the last year or so, he's really been pushing Italian very heavily, obviously through his new his new book and the accompanying TV series. So there's been a lot of noise around um, around Italian and Jamie Oliver typically is a very good uh, barometer of what is of interest to the wider British public because he has such significant influence you know 10 million visitors to his website a month if he's talking about Italian that is going to resonate through and push through to consumers. We're also seeing kind of continued growth on the more premium side of casual Italian dining. So looking at some of the particularly London based um, traditional Neapolitan pizza restaurants, so places like Franca Manca, Pizza Pilgrims really pushing that classic Neapolitan um, pizza recipe and having great success with it. In terms of what this means, you know, we're seeing a lot of updated classics, so people taking these tried and tested Italian dishes, the idea of nonna cooking, you know, and bringing it into the 2020s. And this sort of premiumization and updated classics is starting to filter through into uh, the retailers as well. So we're seeing a lot more kind of wood fired pizzas, fresh chilled pastas, premium indulgent desserts, you know, a lot more innovation around that that's capturing um, kind of the, the public's uh, imagination. And I think really crucially um, to go back to my point of, of Italian being a very unifying um, cuisine, you know, it's uh, data from payment sense. Uh, they ran a survey that showed that 90% of consumers say that Italian is their favorite restaurant choice when they're eating out, you know, so um, it's viewed as a bit more of a premium experience thing to be doing, you know. Um, I think the, the the same survey found that that Chinese and Indian were kind of neck and neck for takeaways. But if people are actually going out to eat, sitting down in a restaurant, you know, Italian is viewed as the top choice because it it does offer something for everyone, and it does offer a bit more of a kind of an experience, an event, um, and a bit more of a premium um, night out. So. I think there's a lot of opportunity with this kind of idea of premium Italian uh, profiles and products as well. Our next consumer is the rebalancer. So the rebalancer is all about balance. So their life is just not about making healthy food choices, but also looking after their all round well-being. Their main goal in life is to eat well, stay hydrated, keep up their fitness routine and stay stress free. So they might follow a strict diet and fitness routine on the weekdays, but they're really not afraid to occasionally indulge on the weekends um, because they worked hard and they think they deserve it. So our first trend um, for the rebalancer is the power of veg. So obviously we're seeing a lot more plant based ingredients um, coming into products um, and really becoming the hero. Um, so whilst plant based is on the rise, it's not just about veganism. A lot of chefs across the UK are celebrating the humble vegetable in their dishes um, and people are starting to think about different ways that they can bring veg into uh, various different products. So 
obviously this trend is driven by the rise of veganism, but it's not limited to vegan products. Um, we're seeing uh, the natural sweetness of vegetables being used to facilitate sugar reduction as well. So a lot of a lot of it around health. Um, bright and bold vegetables are making products more Instagrammable as well. Um, and obviously vegetables are being used as a great way to add fiber to products. In terms of product launches, just some examples here. So things like brightly colored vegetables being used um, in this centerpiece. So that launch was around Christmas time from Morrison's. Um, we're seeing a lot of different varieties of crisps that are using um, vegetables to give natural color. Um, we're seeing things like uh, vegetables coming into new um, products. So things like um, pizza crust there with broccoli and kale or avocado ice cream to make it slightly healthier. Um, and we're even seeing vegetables coming into tea products as well. So you can drink your vegetables. So just some things we spotted as well in kind of blogs and online. Um, we're seeing vegetables being used um, in desserts, so really exciting new inventive way that chefs are um, embracing vegetables. Um, so we think seeing things like sweet corn and sweet potato, obviously naturally sweet products um, being used within desserts. Um, hidden veg is also a phrase that's flying around a lot online. So it's kind of a new wave of recipe inspiration for parents who might want to sneak more veg into kids' diets as well. In terms of our offering, so um, again, we have a wide range of masking and harmonizing flavors and um, that really helps to round off some of the notes and can pair really nicely with vegetable products. Um, we have cheese and dairy, so cheese obviously quite a nice combination with some of these um, vegetable products if they're quite bland. Um, fruit flavor pairing as well um, and botanical and herbal extracts to really tie into that natural um, vegetable trend. So the next trend is positive nutrition. Um, so this is all about um, fad diets being out and fact based scientific health being in. So consumers are now more clued up on their health and well-being than ever before. Um, and they're increasingly demanding products with additional benefits. So with uh, products that promise to balance gut bacteria, build muscle and even help you live longer as well. So this trend is really being driven by um, busy lifestyles um, and the odd slip on the diet plan, um, driving an increase in permissible products. Um, consumers are using social media influencers um, to educate themselves about the next big health trend. So things like protein and gut health and consumers are constantly on the go and they want to maintain their healthy diet outside of home by choosing nutritionally enriched foods. So lots of different products in this area. Um, some examples of some product launches. So we're seeing things like um, fiber added to this porridge there to, have, um, to create a super gut porridge. So that has three times more fiber than just standard oats. Um, this uh, condiment for which has been designed for veggies. So um, you can boost your protein through the condiments. So for example, if you're having a veggie burger and you want to increase the protein, you can add um, this range of sources to it. Um, we have things like on the go breakfast probiotics within cereal bars, um, live sauerkraut, which is rich in probiotics as well, um, and meat actually coming into the protein snack space as well. So things that we're hearing a lot about at the moment, so psychobiotics, this is all about um, consumers becoming increasingly educated on gut health and actually the link between gut health and the brain. So a lot of um, things going around online on this um, and various books that are being written um, and it's a growing area at the moment. Insect protein is another um, emerging trend as well. So consumers are becoming more open to this trend and the use of insect protein within products um, for its environmental benefits and it's starting to slowly make its way into product launches as well. 
So in terms of our offering, um, we have done a lot of work on protein flavour pairing. So that's with plant based proteins and also dairy proteins as well. Um, so a lot of various flavours that work really well on different protein bases. Um, we have flavours and extracts that work really well within fermented products and obviously still provide that natural messaging um, and masking flavours as well. So obviously a lot of these products will have various different off notes um, and we have done a lot of work looking at masking flavours in that area as well. So the final trend for the rebalancer is cutting back. So um, obviously the childhood obesity crisis has reached critical, critical point um, in the UK. So a lot of governments are beginning to introduce recommendations to cut sugar, fat and salt in products. Um, on the other side of that, we're also seeing a lot more people becoming sober curious. So um, they might be choosing not to drink as a lifestyle choice. So they're cutting back on their alcohol consumption as well. So this trend is being driven a lot by governments putting sugar in the spotlight with various campaigns. We're seeing increasing availability of health information by via traffic labelling um, and consumers can make a lot more informed choices um, when it comes to their diets. We're seeing a lot of influence of, from social media, so consumers thinking more about the repercussions of their drinking habits, for example, on social media. And a lot of younger consumers are feeling the burden of um, responsibly eating and to drink better as well. So various product launches within the low and no alcohol space, as well as the reduced sugar and health space on the food side, um, so we've seen things like uh, the UK's first alcohol free aperitifs um, and we're seeing a lot of products being launched with um, reduced sugar, less sugar than your average biscuit, for example, um, fibres being added in um, for more mindful eating, um, things like better for you ice cream as well, um, so venturing into, into desserts. So just some other examples of things we're seeing. So um, alcohol free spirits are being used a lot more by um, mixologists in bars. So they're putting a lot more effort into their mocktail menu than ever before. And we're seeing a rise in savoury flavours as well. So traditionally sweet categories are moving more towards savoury flavours to remove the need for added sugar in their products. Then looking at our offering, so we actually have a, a taste modulation platform at Synergy. So we have various different solutions for sugar, fat and salt reduction. We have a dedicated team that um, only work on these product areas. So they're constantly looking at new ingredients that are coming into the market, how they can work with things like starches, um, fibres to reduce sugar and calorie content to really help you um, meets government guidelines on sugar and fat content. We also have a range of alcohol flavours, so we've um, looked at analysing various alcohol bases and tried to build back some of the flavours that obviously are not um, available within alcohol free products. Um, so we have a range of spirit flavours and various others. We also have um, sweet flavours, so naturally sweet things like honey, maple and dates. Um, and we also um, have a range of dairy flavours that can help to build indulgence in products that might um, have lost indulgence um, through reducing sugar or fat content as well. So our final consumer is the life hacker. So the life hacker is always on the lookout for innovation and particularly if it can save them time. So this consumer is typically quite a young millennial um, or even a Gen Z consumer. They're always really busy. They're trying to balance their work schedules, gym classes and social activities. So they're really looking for convenience in their food choices. But there is also this greater expectation um, surrounding the nutritional benefits and the taste of these products. Um, and also obviously bearing in mind their Instagram worthiness, of course. Um, so they might look for meals that could be eaten anywhere from their desk um, to their evening commute um, with more of a personalised edge to that as well. 
So the first trend we've picked out for the life hacker is on the go. Um, so meals that are traditionally eaten around the table are now being made available in easy to pick up formats that you can enjoy wherever you want to. Um, so new innovation and flavour surrounding meals, um, our requirement, a setting for a traditional sandwich just doesn't cut it for um, our life hacker consumer. So this trend um, is being driven by um, an increasingly busy lifestyle. So a lot more people are on the go. So they're looking for nutrition, more nutritious choices when they're on the go as well. Um, we're seeing a growth in the fourth meal. So a lot more snacking going on with consumers. Um, and we're seeing a rise in accessibility to vegan and veggie options in this on the go market. So some examples of some really innovative product launches that are tapping into this trend. You've got things like this pourable smoothie bowl that's um, that was launched in France. Um, crunchy nut on the go, so no need to add milk, you can just add water to that and you've got yourself a breakfast on the go. These bowl um, products, obviously really nice healthy um, meal that you can have on the go, things like sipping soups and um, a lot of bakery products that you can just eat um, either from defrost or you can bake from, um, from frozen as well. So some various things that we're seeing in restaurants, so um, Starbucks um, has been constantly adding to their vegan range so they've got a lot of different options for vegans now in terms of on the go so they've recently launched their vegan all day breakfast burrito um, Jamie Oliver actually also has um, a really nice section on his website which is just focused on on the go recipes so things like this rainbow salad wrap as an example of one of the recipes there so in terms of our offering in this space so Obviously, a lot of these products are going to be savoury, things like ready meals. So we offer a really nice range of culinary authentic paste. Um, so these all contain store cupboard ingredients um, and they're cooked from those fresh ingredients and they make it really easy to just add um, that paste into your ready meal product, for example. We also have um, a cheese and dairy po flavour portfolio, which can help with things like reducing calories, um, so building back indulgence, but also boosting cheese flavours if you're wanting to reduce cheese content, for example, for cost reasons. The next trend we've looked at for the life hacker is com complete nutrition. So consumers are now looking for products that can replace a meal altogether or even their entire diet. So they're looking for complete nutrition and um, providing them with all the essential vitamins and minerals they need um, without having to take ages to prepare um, a meal or without having to meal prep. Uh, they just want it to be ready, um, ready to go. So this trend is really being driven by brands like Huel and Soylent. Um, feed as well so they're really breaking boundaries in terms of um, challenging what we think of as a meal so a lot of busy um, consumers buy into this convenient product um, and a lot of these products contain all of your nutrients that you need for that one specific meal um, we're seeing a lot more consumers focused around health or sports performance so that's also tying in really nicely with this trend so looking at some product launches, you have things like Nutrigenetics, um, nourished vitamins, which are really personalised to you. So you can type in your health needs, um, what your diet is, um, and then these vitamins are supplied on a monthly basis to help you boost perhaps any vitamins that you're not getting from your food. Obviously, I've mentioned Huel already, um, so a lot of different um, product launches coming from them and feed with these RTD um, meal replacement. So I suppose it's meal replacement has come on a little bit since the days of Slimming World and using these products to try and lose weight. These products are not for you to lose weight, they're for you to replace your meal altogether um, and to make sure you're getting all the nutrients that you need from that meal as well. 
Um, so just an example um, that we're seeing here. So this kind of highlights um, that consumers are more focused around health for sports performance. So uh, the documentary from next Netflix um, called Game Changers really highlighted the benefits of a vegan diet for sports performance. And it's really made waves in the world of sports nutrition as well. So in terms of our offering, um, we've mentioned some of these already before. So we've looked at flavour harmonising on some, some bases that might contain a lot of vitamins, minerals, things that have a lot of off notes, flavour masking we've also worked on as well. So we have worked a lot with a lot of different bases um, and can really use our analytical knowledge to help um, round off the different profiles of these bases as well. We also um, have worked on flavour pairing expertise um, and we use this across um, a lot of different um, bases that you might find within this complete nutrition trend. So then we have personalisation as a trend. Um, so modern consumers are now wanted to make more connections with their food. So this could be either through transparency of ingredients lists, so looking at back to clean label that we mentioned before, or knowing where the ingredients come from. Um, but the trend that we're highlighting here is um, foods that involve some form of participation for a kind of immersive experience or products that are really designed for that one specific consumer. So this trend is being driven by um, the expansion and the growth of online and mobile, shop mobile shopping. So it's easier obviously to have that personalization element um, when you're shopping online. Um, we're seeing a lot more crowdsourcing ideas gaining popularity um, and people wanting to tell stories through food as well. It also allows for nutritional control. Um, we can look at foods that are more suited for specific dietary needs. So just some examples of um, some personalization trends that we're seeing. So obviously recipe box is a huge trend at the moment. So we're seeing um, these recipe box suppliers um, looking to create personalized recipe boxes for people who are on a specific diet. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, um, a lot of innovation around that space. Um, We've got things like Quality Street, Build Your Own. So at Christmas time, we had um, this kind of set up in John Lewis stores. So you could choose your specific sweets that you wanted in your own box and have your name put on it. So if you don't like the coconut uh, sweets that I know a lot of people don't, you don't have to put that in your box. You can just choose the ones that you like yourself. We're seeing things like uh, mystery flavours. So this mystery Oreo is a product from the US. So um, the flavour isn't revealed and they have a competition for you to try and guess what you think the flavour is. Um, and then you have things like at home yogurt makers, obviously bread makers are a huge thing as well. Um, so that can be either plant based or dairy. So looking at um, other things that we've seen in restaurants, blogs and social. Um, so Kellogg's have launched their kitchen crea creations. So this is available on Deliveroo and you can have anything from cheesy cornflake bites, sweet waffles, shakes and vegan hot dogs as well. Kit Kat are also tapping into the personalization trend. So they have launched their chocolatory. So consumers can now choose from a range of 14 different ingredients, four different types of chocolate as well, and they can create their perfect Kit Kat. Um, and that's all done online to make it really easy. So in terms of um, our offering, so we have things like um, fantasy flavours. So, for example, if you were doing a mystery flavour product and you wanted to create something um, kind of unusual that would make it hard for cons consumers to guess what the flavour is, um, then we're able to do that. And we have a lot of clean label paste, extracts, natural flavours that can really help to tie in with this trend as well. So that concludes our Trendcast Consumer Outlook for 2021. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today. Um, if you would like to find out more about how we can support you with upcoming innovation projects, please contact the team using the email address on your screen now. Make sure you also keep your eyes on our social media accounts for further trend content in the coming weeks. Thanks very much for listening.